Hello and welcome to Round Table. The man who led his country into a war that has lasted almost 11 years and cost upwards of half a million lives is making friends again. And some of those are at the heart of Europe. Syria's President Bashar al-Assad was a leader who must step aside, said the European Union in 2011, condemning what it called his brutal repression. What has changed since then? have you along. I'm David Foster. Well, Assad is still there, despite the European Union giving maybe 25 billion euros to the people who were trying to overthrow him. Europe now realises he's going nowhere, and the bloc is split on what to do next. OK, let me introduce Dr Andreas Krieg, senior lecturer at the School of Security Studies at King's College, London. Royal College of Defence Studies. And via Skype from Doha, we have Ali Bakir, political analyst. And in Washington, D.C., we welcome Giorgio Caffiero, chief exec of Gulf State Analytics. Before we get chatting, I'm going to run through some of the slightly shifting sands of Arabia, if I may. Uh, what's happened with regard to Syria? Well, Jordan King Abdullah's telephoned President Assad. He's believed to want sanctions lifted. Uh, the Emirati foreign minister has been to Damascus and along with Algeria, Oman, Bahrain and Jordan is said to want Syria back in the Arab League. Saudi Arabian and Syrian intelligence officials have met recently, we understand, although the Saudi foreign minister says we are not currently considering full re-engagement. Qatar's foreign minister saying normalising relations with the Assad regime is not a step that we're thinking of or considering right now. And the same goes for could wait. So, Georgie, let me come to you first of all. With, with all of those different approaches now, considering where we were in 2011 when the war started and the immediate uh, clampdown on Assad, what, what are we seeing here? What's changing? Well, as the Syrian regime has mostly won the civil war, at least from a military standpoint, Numerous Arab governments over the past couple of years have sort of been shifting in the direction of renormalizing relations with Damascus. To put it simply, I think many Arab regimes, not all of them, but a, a growing number led by the UAE, have sort of come to the conclusion that re-engaging Assad is probably uh, the best option, or maybe we can say the least worst option. And this is sort of about... I guess we could say almost kind of coming to terms with reality and just sort of accepting the outcome of the conflict in Syria. But at the same time, there are definitely other factors in play too that give a number of Arab governments uh, vested interests in renormalizing relations with Assad and trying to rehabilitate his image. Obviously, Assad crushed an Arab Spring uprising. And I think many, uh, very cynically, I think many Arab governments are certainly happy that that, at the end of the day, was the outcome in Syria. OK. Ali, let me put this one to you. If, if Russia was the, the big winner by backing Assad, then Iran has been one of his best friends in this. And one of the reasons, perhaps, why we're seeing these Arab governments um, wanting to normalise relations with the president of Syria is because they don't want to see Iran gaming even more influence. Is, is that the way this is looking to you? Not, not really, because uh, I wouldn't say Assad uh, won the war or is winning, uh, but uh, mostly there are ideological factors, interest factors, and also solidarity factors from the perspective of the Arab governments who are seeking normalization with Assad regime. Uh, at the end of the day, yes, Assad uh, stop the uh, dominant effect of the Arab uprising from reaching certain Arab countries. And also, uh, uh, usually, military dictatorships and uh, governments uh, support each other uh, regardless of the differences between them. We have, like, uh, Egypt and Algeria, for example, supporting Assad regime for a long time. And we have the interest uh, factor uh, represented by Jordan in the current situation. But... Uh, Going back to the main uh, driver behind the normalization efforts with, other Arab, with Assad regime in the Arab world, the UAE, 
the UAE has been uh, promoting uh, the claim that uh, engaging with Assad and rehabilitating him and his regime and uh, uh, supporting him will ultimately decrease Iran's influence uh, over Syria well, and Which, in which the is region. sort of where I, and, where, where I was driving when I, when I asked you the question. So, so if I'm going to turn this now <clears throat> towards Europe, which I will do in a little bit because that's the basis of the, this programme. So we see the Gulf countries trying to normalise relations perhaps because they want to see Iranian influence go down. What is the reason why a number of European countries are perhaps breaking rank, if you like, with the, with the party, with the block line? Yeah, very good point. I think it goes back to what Ali was saying. I mean, there is, there is an, there is an interest-based um, uh, part of that engagement and there is an ideological one. And I think what we see from a European point of view is that the, those Europeans who fall in line with, uh, with re-engaging or the idea of, the, of an, a normalization of the Assad regime are those who are ideologically closer to the counter-revolutionaries in the region. Those are the people like, uh, who are very close to the UAE, who see political Islam as a, quite a problem. They see migration as quite a problem. And they see Syria as been somewhat this kind of uh, regional world war, if you will, that has brought some of the, the most violent non-state actors uh, uh, to, to the forefront, including obviously ISIS. And those kind of European countries are not only in fear of, of migrants coming because of a destabilizing Syria, but they're saying, let's bring back the Assad regime that will keep a, uh, you know, kind of a lid on migration. So it's but also Assad on Assad or ISIS. I mean, it's not as black and white as that, but no, it, it is that, presented. That, that's their thinking. Exactly. The narrative is, if you, what do you want? Do you want the Assad regime or you want ISIS? And pretty much anything has been framed here as ISIS, which is uh, too Islamic for them or is a non-state actor. So can we identify the nature of these European countries that are now lukewarm to pressure on Assad? They're, they're not backing him necessarily, but can we identify them um, either by, by name or by the type of regimes that they have in place? I mean, if you look at Hungary, for example, right? Hungary is one of these illiberal democracies that are, that are increasingly becoming more and more illiberal in, in the eastern part of Europe. They have a fear of political Islam. They have a fear of the Islamization of, um, of the Occident, um, hence why they've always kind of pushed against migration. We've seen that particularly in the narrative in Hungary. Um, a lot of those people who are against migration are on the far right in, in Europe, who are also pushing for a re-engagement with the Assad regime. We've seen that the AFD, for example, the right-wing populist party in Germany has also been outre outreaching to the Assad regime. Um, and uh, you know, we have country, uh, countries like Greece, for example, have a problem with Turkey as well. Who are willing to uh, to re-engage bit by bit with uh, with the Assad regime? Okay, okay. I'm, I'm going to come to you, Giorgio, if, if I may. But before I do that, I want to play this um, from the tourism minister of Syria. There were many political players we could have put up there, but this is from the man in charge of encouraging visitors to come to Syria. Hunak. All European nationalities request to come to Syria. I'm not saying the number of these requests are as it was before the war, but we hope it will increase despite the sanctions and despite the siege. European cultural tourism and Western countries will return to Syria, but we are counting on tourism from friendly countries first. So my question to you, Giorgio, after that is not a, so much how much has Syria recovered, if it has at all, to, to welcome visitors, but are these companies and these people getting in before others do. In other words, they see opportunities here that may not present themselves unless they're first at the gate. Yeah, I think there is a lot of truth to that. It seems that many people who are looking at Syria think that there's going to be some sort of inevitable uh, return of Syria to a status that it was before 2011, being a quote, unquote, normal country. Probably many people around the region and around the world think that the U.S.'s Caesar Act is not going to be imposed on Syria forever. So, so we should explain the point, that the Caesar Act is the act that came out of the United States that basically prevented anybody anywhere doing any business with Assad. That's right. Yeah, these are Trump-era sanctions that the Biden administration has, has kept in place. And that has done so much to limit the extent to which countries around the world are able or willing to in, uh, make investments in Syria or trade with Syria. But I think many people think that at some point down the line, not tomorrow, but some point in the future, Caesar Act won't be there. There will be economic opportunities in Syria. And yeah, I think you're right to point out that some of these people who are maybe trying to go in right now think that there are some advantages to, to getting in before uh, many other people do sort of a some advantages that 
come with sort of taking some risks early on from their perspective. And, and are there countries, Ali, if I can come to you, and of course you can all say something anytime you want, don't wait for me to ask a question, are there countries putting gentle pressure, if you like, on the Biden regime to relax those elements of the Caesar Act um, that are so restrictive for, for other countries besides Syria? Um, are are they trying to sort of change the U.S.'s position? I don't think the Biden administration needs anyone to pressure it to, uh, you know, lesser the pressure on Assad regime because uh, from the beginning, the U.S. administration uh, was using Syria as a card to appease uh, countries like Iran and Russia and try to reach uh, a kind of a deal with them. And this happened during the Obama administration. We all know that how the uh, Obama's red line turned into green light actually to Assad regime to massacre the people and basically he used uh, Syria to reach the DCOP with Iran and now Biden is doing the same thing uh, he's he already has the Caesar Act but he's not uh, obviously applying it uh, we have a, an example the UAE is interacting and uh, actually on so many levels uh, politically economically and even militarily with Assad regime without facing any uh, sanctions, uh, also Jordan lately, and uh, Egypt. So I don't think that these Arab countries are taking initiatives by themselves without the contest or a, a green light from the U.S. administration. Uh, Andres, I mean, say whatever you want, if you, if you like, but I, my question is, does, does this mean Assad is home and free if the United States is, in effect, turning a blind eye mm. and that the European Union will eventually do the same thing? Well, it goes to the, what I wanted to say is that the core element of, of why certain countries are now, even the West, falling into the normalisation uh, camp is because there's a lack of overall strategy. There has been a lack of overall strategy in Washington over a long period of time, going back to the Obama years, where we never really knew what America's objectives were. The objectives that have been recently stated by the US government have been very much tactical or operational. They're never strategic, they're never political. The same goes for Europe. Europe has said what they don't want, but they also never say what they do want. And they never have come up with any means and ways to actually implement it. And that kind of uh, leaves a vacuum. And that vacuum is now uh, being generated or, you know, being played with as opportunity by some countries like the UAE. Yeah. And, and that kind of provides opportunities for the Assad regime. Well, I'm going to play Anthony Blink and the US Secretary of State in just a moment. But if either you, uh, Giorgio, or you, Ali, want to come in at this particular point, I'll wait just a few minutes. Ali, please yeah, carry the on. Europeans usually follow the line of the US. And when they see the US is not willing to put pressure on Assad regime or even try to uh, push him to commit to the outcomes of uh, Geneva uh, communique or the UN uh, resolutions, then they don't have also incentives to do this uh, otherwise. They are just following the US line and everyone is trying to secure its own interests. At the end of the day, some European countries prefer Assad regime to stay rather than to, to see a change in Syria. But ultimately, they are not dealing with the roots of the problem. And this is the main problem to us in the region. Assad is the... Uh, uh, why we do have catastrophes in the region, including migrations and, you know, uh, terrorism and radicalism, and etc. And unless they are willing to face, to face this reality, then we will uh, stay in the same vicious circle. Uh, uh, supporting Assad or rehabilitating him will not solve uh, his own problems or, or the migration problems, in my opinion. OK, I'm going to play Anthony Blinken now. Uh, on Syria. Um... I tell you, we're concerned about the signals that um, some of these visits and engagements uh, uh, are sending. And I would simply urge all of our um, partners to uh, remember uh, the crimes that uh, the Assad regime has committed and indeed continues uh, to commit. Uh, we don't support uh, normalization. So, Giorgio, that's what he's saying, and yet we're hearing from you guys around the table, that in fact the US is turning a slightly blind eye to what's going on. Would those stalwarts of um, punishing Assad in Europe, such as Germany, um, France, Italy, be likely to do a similar thing, to say we don't like the guy, we say he's got to leave, but at the same time understanding that there's a real politic in this and he's unlikely to be going anywhere? Yeah, you know, I think there's an important... Um divide in Europe that we should point out. There, as Andreas mentioned, you have a government in Hungary which is very, very sympathetic to Assad and everything he's done over the past 10 years. If you listen to Hungarian officials speak, they portray Assad as a defender of Christians, 
They think that he's been triumphant in fighting terrorism. Now, that kind of narrative is totally rejected by European countries in Western Europe. I think there's going to come a point eventually where probably all or most of the EU members renormalize relations with Syria, but there's not going to be ceremonies or flowery rhetoric when that happens. There's not going to be photo ops of the Syrian embassies reopening in Western European capitals. It will be sort of, if it happens, I think it will be because they concluded that it was necessary to do so, not because there's any sympathy or love for Assad or the people around him. In fact, they're doing something of the sort at the moment, aren't they? They're putting in, instead of ambassadors, they're mm -hmm. putting in charge d'affaires, yep. which in many ways is exactly the same. It's looking after countries' interests in another nation, but doesn't send the big signal. Yes. I, mean, I think it's a gradual, I agree with it, that Giorgio here, this is a gradual normalization. We, we shouldn't expect anything to happen in the short or midterm. I think this is a more of a long-term development. But it will happen gradually, where sanctions will be lifted gradually, where normalization happen, happens gradually. Also, the, on the ground, we've seen the regime recapturing territory gradually. It's not something that, you know, the, the normalization within Syria is something that the Assad regime has done also gradually. So this is, take, Assad has always played the long-term card. And there's one thing that Western countries can't do is long-term thinking, long-term strategy, in Europeans including uh, uh, as, as much as the Americans as well. And I think this kind of gradual phasing out of sanctions, the gradual restoration of some sort of relationship with the Assad regime is something that we're, that we're most likely going to see and, uh, you know, doing that for a variety of different reasons. 24 billion euros, give or take a few hundred million here or there, is what the European Union has pushed into. Um, humanitarian efforts, looking after refugees, mm. um, supporting the opposition. In other words, money to topple yep. Assad to some extent. <laughs> and now it's sort of saying, well, actually, you're probably going to stay there. We'll, we'll, we'll have to deal with you. That, that's the reality of life. Has the European Union, have the United States, to some extent, been humiliated in this yes. by Russia? Absolutely, not just by the Russians, but by including by the regime. The regime has actually played all its cards and it's still there, despite, you know, the alleged only superpower in the world with, you know, support by its very important P5 nations, Western Europe, supporting the, the toppling of the regime. And I think what the, the signal that it sends actually to other authoritarians in the region is that in the end of the day, the liberal world order, while it still has some teeth, is not able to actually change uh, what happens on the ground. And uh, that's a major defeat. For that. And for isn't that either you, Ali, or I'll come to you first of all, Georgia, isn't that exactly what many of the authoritarian rulers um, in the Middle East wanted to see, that um, no matter what you try and do, the people at the top are going to stay in power? You know, for many years and decades, the Syrian government had relationships with Iran, with Lebanese Hezbollah that made many Arab regimes and um, very uncomfortable with the way Assad was running Syria. But again, at the end of the day, though, uh, he is one of their fellow um, Arab authoritarian rulers. And I think most of the governments in the region, I'm not talking about societies here, but I'm just talking about governments in the region, were nervous about what a post-Assad Syria could look like and what would be the precedent set if there was a successful Arab Spring revolution in Syria. I think Assad's survival has come as a relief to a number of Arab governments. We've got um, Poland and Hungary that have been quoted. There's also Serbia, uh, Greek Cyprus, uh, Austria, other countries in Europe that are leaning towards Assad to some extent. Um, how will they be able to, to leverage this, apart from migration, to their benefit if they get close to Assad. When we're seeing Russia, this is for you, Ali, it's for everybody, in fact, when they see Russia already well in there, China making inroads, they're two massive economic and military powers. How are these small nations going to make any capital out of this? I'm not sure they are going to do any capital. I mean, the, the only thing that they are doing is, is uh, presenting uh, service for the Assad regime on behalf probably uh, of other countries, and we, you have mentioned now uh, some countries, but we have countries like France that would be probably okay with Assad staying in power. Uh, France has been also uh, supporting dictators in the Arab world, in Egypt, in Libya, and uh, elsewhere. So 
it's not, it's, 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 I don't believe that uh, Europeans uh, didn't have the leverage to pressure Assad. It's that, and I agree with Andreas here, uh, he played uh, on the time card very well, and he, uh, as a regime, knows what he wants. But the Europeans, they were, uh, you know, against each other, no unified, really, uh, position and no real action, just words. And uh, at the end of the day, they followed the U.S. line, and the U.S. was not willing to topple uh, uh, as I said, uh, they, they use Syria as a card. So I don't see an end game here. Okay, they are trying to give us the lifeline right now uh, indirectly, but I see the problems staying there uh, in a way or another. You, you nodded when yeah. um, Ali there mentioned France. I'll ask you about Germany, Italy and the other bigger countries in just a moment, but France's mm -hmm. position must have shifted dramatically. Yes and no. I mean, under Macron, and I completely agree with Ali, under Macron, we've seen France becoming a lot more a populist country, a, a country that is trying to is clamp down on particular political Islam. If you look at the elections going on at the moment, political Islam is vilified, securitized, and fighting Islamism um, equals fighting terrorism for Macron. We've seen that happening in Libya. Uh, we've seen that happening supporting the UAE in, in Yemen as well. And Assad also fits into that kind of narrative because Assad has from the beginning said, I'm fighting terrorism. Although he was clamping down on, 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 on revolutionaries, it was fighting terrorism. And that narrative has been adopted and propagated by the UAE and has now been adopted by the Macron government as well. And I think that is, that is highly problematic. But it also says that, you know, realpolitik is a lot more important. It's about geostrategic interests. We don't really care that much from a Western point of view so about liberal values. Forget principles. Correct. And that is exactly the crisis that the liberal world order is in, because we don't stick up for the principles that we once advanced. OK. Um, Giorgio, Germany, Italy, other progressive liberal countries, if you like, within, within Europe, are they going to push those principles to one side and eventually come to realise that they have to live with Assad and they have to get on with it? I think eventually that will happen, but probably those EU members that you just mentioned, I think they'll probably be some of the last uh, members of the EU to make that move. And eventually, when they do it, it'll be because they wanted to save face in the first point, uh, first hand. Do you think that means that they will have missed out on opportunities? I think that's fair to say. Um, from you know a very Machiavellian country, uh, a, a Machiavellian standpoint, the countries that are trying to re-engage Syria early on will probably uh, benefit in certain ways from doing so. And you talk about economic opportunities, but I think. The view in countries like Italy and Germany is that Assad's crimes simply put him beyond the pale and there's not really an appetite for doing anything to legitimize or partially legitimize his government. But again, this brings us back to this other question. What are the other options? If Assad is going to stay and if you want to have some sort of a relationship with Syria that's going to require having some sort of a relationship with the government, it's very humiliating. There's definitely a lot of pride swallowing that has to take place. But because I don't think there are really any other options, I do believe that mm. pretty much most of Europe will move in that direction. But again, countries like Italy and Germany probably moving in that direction at a much slower rate. At least that's my opinion. Let's look at it from inside Syria, if we may, Ali, and say what is in this for Assad other than remaining in power? And what leverage does he have, because we've recently done on this program uh, Sudan and the threats from one of the military rulers there to, to open the borders and let migrants flood into Europe. We've done the same with Belarus and Poland and the, and the border there. Um, could Assad use that as, as leverage to get what he wanted out of the European capital? Yes, sure, sure. And he has been trying uh, for a time, uh, uh, attacking uh, Idlib, for example, where more than three and a half million people uh, residing is catastrophic. And uh, uh, we know that uh, Turkey stopped his plans uh, when he was supported by uh, Iran and Russia a couple of years ago. And uh, he can still, and I mean, he wants to try right now to, uh, again, but I'm not sure whether Turkey will allow him to do this uh, at uh, this point, he's also making use of the rapprochement efforts and the normalization efforts from the Arab world and also from the Europeans to try to uh, leverage this against those who are still uh, refuse uh, Assad to stay in power, okay. whether internal opposition or external uh, countries like Turkey. Uh, he's making use of these uh, connections to yeah. leverage them against uh, these countries. And also he's making use of the 
uh, his supporters, the Iranians and uh, Russians, trying sometimes to balance between them and Ali, using uh, uh, one of them against the other. I'm going to have to cut you off mid-flow there because we're coming towards the very end. And Andreas, I just wanted to ask you this. Mm. Um, we talked about Russia being a winner, Assad being a winner. Who are the losers in well, this? Well, I think those who have really backed the opposition early on, at least for the moment, come out to be the losers. That is Turkey, that is Qatar. Um, um, Saudi Arabia, who've also been on the opposite side of, uh, of, of fighting uh, Assad. But, you know, I, I, I'm looking at this with a little bit more caveat because I don't think that Assad necessarily has one. He's, he's a very, he's not as stable as he used to be. The regime is still in a lot of areas uh, on, on, on the balance. And, you know, it could easily, we could easily see an outspring to beyond point half time. We're in time added on, are we? Yes, but there might be another, uh, there might be another uh, 90 minutes to play. You don't know that. Let's hope not. Thank you very yeah. much indeed. 90 minutes lasting 11 plus years. Thank you very much indeed from Doha. Thank you uh, from thank Washington, D.C. Andres, very good to see you back in the studio. And thank you uh, wherever you happen to be watching this edition of Roundtable. We'll be back pretty soon. For now, from me, David Foster and the Roundtable team, goodbye. <laughs>